It gives a precedent to start to create protocol to protect undocumented students. And it's not law, and we know that, and we have informed our students on that. And our students know that becoming sanctuary wouldn't mean that they're completely safe from possible deportations. They know that there's still a possibility because it doesn't mean that it's law. So our students are educated, and our students know this. And despite of that, Knowing, despite of them knowing that it it won't be something signed into law that would have actual effect on a court, they still want to pass this as a symbol of resistance against um, the oppression from our current administration and the fear of, you know, I'm not speaking only as a student trustee, but just speaking as an immigrant and speaking as a member of this community, I am... I am tired. I am tired that governing bodies base their decisions um, upon fear, base their decisions upon volatility, and base their decisions upon leaders that clearly don't have um, don't have a good way of even analyzing things and looking at the people that are part of their country. And yes, if the current administration is volatile, and that um, clearly represents a danger to a lot of the things that. Um, are part of our community, we know we know they're a danger. Since before he became president, we knew he was a danger. Um, so those fears, you know, they're present. They're present, they're really present, especially amongst our undocumented community who have to wake up every day not knowing if they're gonna continue to be here and continue to have the opportunities to improve their lives. But we cannot base decisions upon fear. You know, I, I think this country and for those who have and who remember history, um, a lot of decisions have been made upon fear. And many of those decisions are looked at now as a mistake. Um, like I said, I think the student perspective to this board is extremely enormous. And with all respect, with really all respect to this governing body, um, I think this you know, Shiba College Sanctuary Resolution is immensely important for our students. Because like I said, they know it's a symbol. They know it, they're educated on it. Um, but they want the symbol to be a part of who we are as a college and as a community and as a community college district. They want people, you know, I invited friends like my friend Alexander Griffin here. He came all the way from Richmond in support. Our student trustee Miguel from Ohlone College came all the way from Fremont to be here in this meeting and express their support. And all of our students who traveled all the way from Chabot to Dublin and peak hour traffic, they're here for a reason because they know what the symbol means. meeting too. I, it's been a long meeting, I know. I, I know we all want to move forward. Um, thank you a lot for your clarification on the California Acts value, um, Chancellor Jackson. Um, but on that note, you know, like I said before, our students are informed on what this resolution means. And despite of maybe the, bo the board voting yes on this resolution for the community college district, there's still a possibility of voting yes for the Chabot Sanctuary, you know, and it would be an extra point of support for all of our students that they know that not only does their community back them up, but the ones who represent them at the district level backs them up, and that we're here to support each one, that we're here to support each one another, and that all these fears and volatility that our students are experiencing in these moments should not be a reason for them to continue their education and should not be a reason for them to um, not be able to go to school, you know, because we all should have an equal opportunity of getting a good education and following our dreams and living in peace in this country because we all deserve that. And I think every single member of this board wants the best for the students. 
I know all the trustees and our chancellor, their main purpose of being a part of this board is to ensure that our students feel safe and welcome and have the opportunity to have the greatest education that they can because both of our colleges are great and both of our colleges create amazing opportunities for our students in this district. And like one of my other senators said, I love Chabot, I love Chabot, and Chabot has changed my life so much and it even makes me wanna cry because I'm also an immigrant. And when I moved here three years ago, I felt like I didn't have a space in this country. I felt like I wasn't enough and all the effort I did in Mexico was not gonna be appreciated here. And once I got to Chabot, they made me feel welcome, and they made me feel safe. And I'm going to be here sitting as a student trustee, as a member of my community. Um, if it weren't for all the support I've gotten throughout the years, all the support I've gotten from all my teachers, from my classmates and peers, um, and for the opportunity of this board to have me here and express this opinion, I really urge the board to not only adopt this resolution, which I completely agree, it's a great start, but to also adopt our Chabot Sanctuary Resolution. With that, thank you very much. Point of clarification, and uh, also, but what we heard tonight was both colleges. What we heard tonight was district policy. And for my point of clarification, and for point of information for you folks, I represent District One, which is Hayward, but I also represent the district, as all of the trustees here do. And I haven't heard anything from Wasco Cedars College, and it does seem logical that Las Vegas College should also be part of this because when I vote, I have to vote for the district. I can't vote for where I live, Chabot College. I am mandated as a trustee of the district of the Chabot Las Vegas district to represent the whole district. So my point of clarification that I'm asking the president is, is are we required to have also the voice of Las Positas when there is this type of resolution other than the one that we're voting on tonight? Um, and I just need a point of clarification. Yeah, I mean, we already have I, I believe, uh, uh, how, how easy, like, come on. The only item that is on the board for consideration tonight is the California Values Act. Um, Amend it. And amend it. And amend. 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 Please, amen please, let's keep the quorum. Um, and so that is the only item that is on here at the meeting on October second that I mentioned in my report. Um, I asked the uh, constituent presidents at Chabot to reach out, and I believe that they have done that. And that has been the issue with putting it on a, a agenda, is that we haven't got that. I think that they are ready to do that now, um, but again, that is taking us so it's my understanding five months. That is I'm not in the district. Okay, let me need a wrap, Chancellor. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so it's my understanding that the reason it's not on the agenda is because we don't have the concurrence from Las Vegas. Or feedback, one way or the other. Feedback, okay. Oh, I hope you that now. I, I think it will. The, uh, the fact you said to Las Vegas College. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I do. The Las Vegas College Senate, Academic Senate, is working currently on a resolution um, which parallels the Chabot resolution. We will discuss this resolution at this week's meeting and we have invited all of the senates from Las Positas College to, um, for classified professionals as well as students to join in on the resolution. 
At the next board meeting, the students from Las Positas College plan to attend and voice their opinions as well. Six months. All right. Six months instead of five now. Oh, Lori, you have something to add? Well, I just felt like uh, I know that you did a farther, and we've been working on this from Shibo, uh, all the sentence that classified the students for a long time. We, it took us a long time to actually put it together and do all the wording together. I felt very proud of that whole process. And we know, like you said, that some things are symbolic. But I feel that voting on this other thing that's law anyways is making sense. <laughs> our students and that we can um, say that to our students that we are supporting them um, and I think in this country if we don't start speaking of it if we don't start seeing how we all are in this together and it's very important to all of us that we aren't going to go anywhere and, and I think there's some time you have to stand up for what you think is right and that's what our fa students are doing, our faculty are doing. We're standing up for what we think is right for our students. Um, and even if it's symbolic, it doesn't matter. If it's symbolic, we want to know that you in this room support us. All right. We, we... Noel, you left with my hand. I just wanted to add classified Senate's remarks, and I think to hear the student Senate president may also want to add his remarks. Um, I think we all had all planned on making statements about this resolution during our uh, reports. But since we're kind of going out of order, I would like to provide that information now before you take a vote or, or make any decision to take action. Um, so at our October 20th Classified Senate uh, meeting, we discussed current issues revolving around changes in the Board of Trustees meetings, times, and locations, and the Board of Trustees' lack of official response to Chabot College's sanctuary resolution. And I plan on sharing uh, classified sense concerns on both of those issues with you, but right now I'll just speak directly to the sanctuary resolution piece. So I'll begin by noting that the classified senate worked very closely with academic senate and student senate throughout spring 2017 to craft and adopt the sanctuary resolution that was presented to the board in May. And classified senate played a major part in that presentation and we have been monitoring the progress of the resolution since then. Having the board adopt a resolution in support of our undocumented and marginalized student populations has been and continues to be a top priority for Classified Senate. And I know I've mentioned that in my each of my board reports, I believe, since um, the, May, the last May meeting. Um, to date, the board has not taken action on our resolution. So during the Senate meeting, questions arose around resolution number 06-1718, which we're discussing now. And the prevailing question that came up in Classified Senate is whether this resolution was intended to take place of our sanctuary resolution. And the concern of Classified Senate is if that was the case, uh, they, they stated that they did not think that this resolution sends a strong enough or clear enough or compassionate enough message of support for undocumented and marginalized student populations. So like our student trustee has recommended um, potentially adopting this resolution on the board agenda tonight is a good start and we need to think about what to do next after that. Hi, Hi. Board President and uh, Chancellor Jackson. Um, since we are going out of turn, uh, I wanted to go ahead and just share at least the sanctuary resolution aspect of my statement. I do urge all, everyone in the audience to remain here after, um, you know, after this uh, specific uh, item on the agenda to also hear the reports from the faculty, classified, and student senate uh, presidents. Um, so the Tri-Senate Sanctuary Resolution that was presented last year to be placed on the board agenda has still not been discussed and our students have been waiting for months to hear feedback. After being silent and refusing to put the Sanctuary Resolution on the agenda for five months, <laughs> the Chancellor and Board President finally decided to meet and discuss the resolution. As uh, Dr. Jackson mentioned, on, May, on Monday, October 2nd, the presidents of the faculty, classified, and student senate, as well as the president of Chabot College, met with the president and chancellor. After an hour-long meeting, 
the conversation still did not materialize into anything substantive and the Chancellor has still refused to put the matter on the agenda. At the time, the Chancellor claimed that the number one reason uh, was that we would lose funding. I want to make this very, very, very clear. We did our due diligence. She handed us a packet that had $24 million that was allocated from the federal government to this community college district. We did our due diligence. The federal government cannot, the executive branch cannot touch money allocated as Pell. That is uh, appropriated through Congress. So that's already, uh, I believe, 18, 16 million of our overall funding. As well as that, we cannot lose funds, uh, grants. So TRIO, Excel, Aspire, these kinds of programs cannot be cut. So, you know, I find it very strange that the Chancellor brings up misinformation when she herself has clearly misinformed everyone in the audience right now. I reached out to the Chancellor and Board President and asked repeatedly when the matter will be put on the agenda. Nearly three weeks have passed and I have still yet to hear a response from either body. I cc their assistants, I cc literally every other person that I possibly could. For three weeks. <laughs> our students cannot wait any longer. We have waited for more than five months to have our Chancellor put this matter on the agenda and have yet to hear any proposed dates. Obstacles like this make it impossible to have a democratic process that functions in any capacity. Our students are worried for their safety, whether they are undocumented or not, and don't feel the support of their district in these times of dire need. Sitting to my right is Alex Griffin, board member of the Board of Governors of California. He is here to support the student voice and the voice of Chabot College at the district level. President Griffin's community college district, Contra Costa College, district has been able to pass a sanctuary resolution at the Board of Trustees level at a 6-0 to zero unanimous vote and explicitly said the word sanctuary. I urge the Chancellor to not remain silent on the issues of our students anymore and to, put, and to please put the Tri-Senate Sanctuary Resolution on the agenda for the next Board of Trustees meeting. clarify something. Um, what I said at the meeting was not the number one reason was finance. I said there are several actions, as I explained tonight. The other thing that I said is that there is power in numbers, and as the one board member, Trustee Mintzman, said, we have not heard anything from LPC. You heard the... Can I, can I finish? Can I finish? The Academic Senate said they're getting ready to discuss that on Thursday. So that reaching out has resulted in a possible resolution coming from LPC. And I told you that I am not willing to move forward until I get that because the board is going to ask me about that. And, you say that's and the right board now. president yeah. also expressed Why that. Don't we don't know? So, we are now at that point where we're getting that feedback from LPC and we can move forward. But that was explained expressly at that meeting. I said, I ask each of you to reach out to your constituent groups, the faculty senate to reach out to the faculty senate, the classified senate to reach out to the classified, and the students to reach out to the students. And I ended that by saying there is power in numbers because we are a district that represents two colleges and if the board should address that, they need to do it with the support of both colleges, not just one. So clarification, those are the things that I said, and I believe that Trustee Jen was there to, to expose that I said something else is not true. Thank you, Chancellor. I'd like to uh, ask that the Student Senate President of Los Cedas, you have your hands raised? Yes. Um, so I would... <coughs> My bad, sorry. Okay. Um, well, Academic Senate has been working closely with our UNDOCUALI task force to do a resolution, like it has been said already. Mm. And so that's going to be um, reviewed tomorrow at the meeting. But Las Positas has supported Chico and our community. We're all together. We're going to do this thing together. Um, and we're all different people. We have different backgrounds. We have different stories. But we're all here for the same reason, and that should be for the students. Um, I think to some extent we all want to leave a legacy here. Um, I know I do, and I know 
Um, what I want to be part of my legacy is the sanctuary district together. So what's going to be your legacy? I do want to read this resolution that we're considering at this point. If you would please uh, allow me to do so. Whereas the California Values Act was signed into law on October 5th, 2017, this package of 11 bills will go into effect January 1, 2018, supporting and providing some level of protection to both undocumented and immigrant populations of the state. Whereas Four of the bills in the California Values Act apply directly to community college, colleges, including one, Senate Bill 54 sets limits on the help that the various agencies and institutions can provide to the federal immigration and custom enforcement agencies. Two, Assembly Bill 21 requires colleges that offer Cal grants to create policies that safeguard their campuses from immigration officials by ensuring personal information of students and faculty is not released and by notifying students and faculty when immigration agents are on campus. Three, Assembly Bill 343 allows in-state tuition of California community colleges for students with a refugee status and those who have special immigrant visa to work with the American military and for Senate Bill 68 expands on state law allowing undocumented do uh, immigrants to qualify for in-state tuition. Previously the law said undocumented students have to have spent three years at a California high school and graduated. Under the new law students can count years spent at a California community college or adult education courses towards the three-year requirement for in-state tuition. Essentially, with more than three years of public high school, a student can be treated as an AB 540 or Dreamer students. Whereas, the Chabot Las Posadas Community, Community College District has long had a long-standing tradition of culture of inclusiveness towards all students providing access of uh, instructional programs and student services regardless of immigration or other status and of protecting the privacy of students' records to the fullest extent of the law. Now be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of the Chabot Las Positas Community College District formally offers its support for the opportunities and protections provided to students in Senate Bill 54 and 68 and Assembly Bill 21 and 343, and direct the district, Chabot College, and Las Lucias College to implement such steps as are necessary to be in compliance with these laws by January 1, 2018. And at this time, I will entertain a motion, uh, so who wish to make uh, a motion for its adoption from the board. Second, moved and seconded. Any further discussion from board members? This is a roll call vote, so I ask that the recording secretary please call roll. Trustee Dvorsky? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Lee? Yes. Trustee Metzman? Yes. Trustee Beccarelli? Yes. Trustee Randolph? Yes. We have the announced vote on that. Uh, Trustee Gillis is excused. Okay. All right. With that vote, I, I have to say that uh, I'm glad that the board has voted publicly to show its support of our undocumented uh, students and immigrant students uh, and we have not been doing not we let me rephrase it it is not the fact that we are not we have not been addressing the issue we have there are a lot of other concerns that we have about how each of you can be protected 
as students who are immigrant students and so forth. This is a big first step for us, what we did tonight. Now for many of you, it may not be enough, but that can come later. But at this point, this is a big step for us. Uh, I know that everyone up here certainly support students. It is our role that we're here that we're supporting you. Contrary to many of the statements we heard tonight that we may not care about you, we do care. Many of us here, including myself, come from immigrant families. As a child of immigrant parents, we, I've been through many of the stuff that you have gone through. I'm not saying that mine is worse than yours, but I certainly sense a lot of the pain and insecurity that many of you are going through now. Or, But this is a big first step for us. I hope uh, you see that, that we are all here for you. We are not against any of you. We certainly heard a lot of comments today about fears of, of not wanting to be here and so forth. The officers here are not here to worry those who may be a undocumented and so forth. It's to protect all of us. This is like a part of a campus community, even though this is not where teaching occurs. This is considered Chabot Las Positas Community College District. And as a district, it is as same as, as though it was a campus community. So I hope no one ever feels unsafe to be here because uh, this is not a campus. We treat this just as much as a campus. Uh, we look forward to some additional discussions at uh, Las Vegas College from the students who will provide us some input at our next meeting. All right, any other items on that before we move on, continue on with the agenda? Right. Okay, we are now back on, on line with the agenda, which is item, I believe, 1.7, is that correct? All right, which is approval of consent items. Consent items are designated by CC and are expected to be routine and not controversial. They will be acted upon by the Board of Trustees on a single vote without discussion. Any member of the board or public may request that an item be removed from this section for later discussion. Let's take a minute to allow those folks who, be, who wish to leave to do so. You're welcome to stay. Um, board President um, Chin, uh, if I may say so, um, I do urge everyone to please stay for the duration of the meeting. Um, the faculty, uh, classified, and student president still have not addressed the rest of their statements. It's really important that we get the rest of the message out there. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone who wish to have an item removed from the consent calendar? Yes, the trustee Mitzman. Uh, 4.13. 4.13, already. Others? <clears throat> I would also like to have item uh, four, excuse me, item 5.4 remove for a correction. Is there any other item that we need to remove from the consent calendar? If not, I entertain a motion for approval of the rest of those items. Okay, move for approval. Move and second it. All those in favor of uh, approving except item 4.1.3, is that correct? And item 5.4 for later discussion. All right, is there other, any other discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion for approval. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. <laughs> okay. Next item is 1.9, which is public hearing regarding the 2017-18 budget. General Fund, Cafeteria Fund, Student Development Fund, State, uh, excuse me, Capital Projects Fund, as well as Self Insurance, which is the Rumble Fund, as well as Measure D. The 
public hearing is now open. Are there any comments from the public? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing. Tony yes, Warder. Sir. Tony Warder. Could we have someone close that back door, please? It is closed. <laughs> rabble, 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 rabble. All right. Thank you. Chancellor, could you, you provide some information regarding uh, our presentation on the budget? Thank you, Dr. Jin. Um, this is a required presentation of the 2017-18 budgets, which has been deferred from the September board meeting. Uh, received approval from the State Chancellor's Office to bring it to the October board meeting. And this is a balanced budget, and we have addressed the overexpenditure from previous years that were brought up by Trustee Maduli uh, at a preliminary budget hearing in June. And at this meeting, we are asking the board to review and adopt these budgets. And Vice Chancellor, we ask you to review the PowerPoint presentation that was provided in your packet. Go ahead, yes. Good evening. With, with that uh, introduction, I'll go right ahead into a, a brief PowerPoint presentation for, for the board and the audience. Uh, presentation summary, we'll go over the budget requirement, the state budget uh, proposal. We'll take a look at student enrollment, major revenue and expenditure assumptions. We'll take a look at our uh, budget allocation model and then the budgets themselves. And we'll look ahead to see what the opportunities and budget risk are for our district. As, as mentioned, this is a requirement. Um, we, we did get approval from the State Chancellor's Office to delay our, our budget uh, adoption from the September 15th to today, uh, due to uh, some circumstances that happened in the last couple of, of months. So we're fine there. Um, as, as you know, the state uh, adopts this budget and we follow uh, what the state provides. Uh, districts. This is just a brief summary of some of the items that were provided to community college district. It uh, provides uh, full funding for the uh, Proposition 98 guarantee. It provides funding for access, which is uh, growth uh, for our district. Uh, we are um, anticipating 1% growth. COLA or cost of living adjustment is 1.56. The next item I want to point out is an increase in our base allocation funding. That, that is uh, unrestricted funds where we have, the district has discretion. Uh, that amount was increased by $183 million statewide. That equates to about a 2.78% uh, COLA equivalent for our district. Guided Pathways is a big uh, deal with the state at this point, $150 million uh, one time. And then we have uh, funds for maintenance instructional equipment like the last three, four years. Student fees has been maintained at $46 per uh, credit unit. So those are just some of the items that came down from the state. In terms of our um, enrollment, we are growing um, the <coughs> at, at a very slow pace, I, I would say, probably uh, about 1% over the last uh, three, four years. What this is showing here is in 1617, the land, the second line uh, from from the bottom, um, is where district was in stability, and I will explain that a little later. But uh, go into 1718, where we are projecting uh, an enrollment of about 17,400. We are looking at 1718 as our reset year because we were in stability uh, last year and. Um, and, and made some enrollment adjustments the two years prior to that, we're saying that it's about time that we reset our uh, enrollment um, moving forward, and, and that's what you see for 1718. Let me explain those stability uh, funding. When your enrollment goes down from one year to the next, there's a safety net that the, the state provides. It says that safety net um, guarantees that you will get the same funding as you did the prior year. So even though you're, you're, you're declining enrollment. So we, we, did, we, we use this safety net for, for our district. That's the stability funding. There's an additional safety net in the system where if you, were, uh, if you decline in your enrollment, you have a chance to restore that enrollment in the next three years. So that's also a, a safety net. And this 
um, we, we use the safety net for the stability. We're going to be using this safety net to restore our enrollment uh, to get back to the um, high water mark, uh, if you will. Um, so here's what our enrollment looks like. Uh, let me point your attention to 1617. Uh, because we're on stability, um, we are being funded at that 17,640 FDES, which is the same level as the prior year. Does everyone see that? that that's, that's, that's the stability. But if you were to just take the net um, for 1617, uh, our actual enrollment without any rollbacks is it's actually at 17,307. And so from there, we are projecting about a 1% growth to get us to 17,400. So as you can see, there is this gradual growth that we are experiencing in, in, in the district. Albeit uh, small, we are growing as opposed to other districts that are declining between you know, 1 and 5% if, if you look at uh, around our area. Uh, we are doing many things in, in terms of uh, trying to maintain and grow our enrollment. Uh, we have um, in place many marketing efforts to be able to, to do that. Uh, so again, the takeaway here is uh, we, we are growing, um, although at a, a slower uh, pace. Uh, some of the major revenue assumptions, I'm not going to go through all this, just to point out that uh, the first number there, per credit uh, FTES, we receive about uh, $5,072. Uh, and our total general apportionment, the last line there, is uh, $100 million. So unrestricted general fund, we're a $100 million business. And you will see later on that our restricted side is also in excess of $100 million. Some major uh, expenditure assumptions. Um, we need to manage our expenditures similar to managing our revenues. This is based on that 17,400 students. Um, our our um, staffing is, is based on that number. Uh, this budget provides for the salary increases of 3% to all our employees for the 1718 uh, fiscal year. Step and column and longevity increases. If, if you're an employee that goes up a step or moves a column, uh, this budget provides for those uh, increases, premium increases for our health and medical and dental benefits, that's health and welfare. Uh, increases in retiree health benefits as well as increases in stirs and purse. Uh, we made an assumption that utilities will increase by about uh, 5%. And a couple of years ago, we conducted a classification study for um, some employee groups, and those increases are also included in this budget. Here's another major assumption that I think we're going to spend a couple more uh, minutes on. Uh, and that is the Chabot uh, College budget and fund balance restoration. In 1617, Chabot had a structural deficit of about $3.2 million. That means expenditures exceeded revenues by $3.2 million. But by the end of the year, with some adjustments, um, Chabot ended with a $2.5 million negative balance. Now, we have a budget allocation model that uh, allows for a college or a location um, to restore its ending balance. And so Chabot uh, submitted a plan uh, under the signature of uh, Dr. Sperling on how to reverse um, their uh, structural deficit as well as make up the $2.5 million negative, um, negative balance. And this is their plan. Uh, Chabot is to rebuild uh, its ending balance uh, to 5% of expenditures over the next five years. How will they do this? They will allocate 2% of annual unrestricted general fund revenues. So off the top, the 2% they'll set aside to restore um, the 16-17 negative balance. And any designated uh, unrestricted general fund surpluses so if you had savings in some areas, those monies will be uh, utilized to make up for that uh, 2.5 million negative fund balance. So that's, that is, that is the, the plan. And if there are questions 
I'll defer them to um, either Dr. Sperling or uh, Ron uh, Gethard, our CBO for Shibo, who's at the audience. But for 1718, the structural deficit has been addressed. And mainly that is due to um, just um, reduction in expenditures to stay in line with the revenues for 1718. I will pause there because I know there's some questions from the, the, the board. Trustee Madilla. Since I raised this issue uh, during the tenant budget presentation, I, I feel that I have to address this again for the final budget adoption. I recognize and appreciate the effort that Vice Chancellor Gaspi and Vice President of, of Administrative Services, Ron Gerhardt, in their collaboration to fix the structural deficit for 1718, and that was done. However, there's a carryover of a two and a half million dollar deficit into 1718. My question is, does the district already have a 5% greater reserve? If that's so, why is the college having to maintain a 5% reserve? Is that part of the allocation model? Why not fix deficit once and for all, rather than building up to a 5% level when I don't believe it's required? Yes, let, let me address one, one part of that question, and I will defer the other part to uh, uh, Shibo College. As a district, uh, we are required by the state to keep a 5% reserve as a minimum. But as a district, and with the support of the board, uh, we have increased that minimum from 5% to 8%. So as a district, we carry at least an 8% reserve. But as you will see later on, our fund balance is uh, much higher than that. And um, th that, that is part of our conversation in terms of um, planning and preparing for uh, the next recession. It's our rainy day fund. So to answer your question, uh, the district maintains at least an 8% reserve, now even higher for the rainy day fund. Now, uh, in our uh, budget allocation model through our planning and budget committee, which is a statewide, uh, statewide, I mean, district-wide committee, um, the colleges are to maintain a 1% reserve at the local level. Okay. Now, Chabot is proposing that they maintain a 5% um, fund ending balance at their local level. I will defer that to Chabot in terms of the um, discussion at their local budget committees as how they came up with that number. Um, Dr. Sperlin? Thank you, Vice Chancellor Legaspi. And I am going to, um, with your permission, defer that question to our uh, chief financial wizard at the campus, and that would be Vice President Ron Gerhardt. Thank you. Uh, the answer to that is, is um, really to provide additional stability to the college. Um, the last few years, as, as you recognize, it, it's been somewhat financially turbulent. Um, partly because, well, a myriad of things, I'll put it that way. Uh, but the, the reason for the, the increase is really to provide a safety net and fiscal stability and supporting the planning. Uh, so, for example, that 5% would be approximately $2 million for us. Last year, we deficit spent by about $2 million. So, that's kind of the thought process behind it. Uh, again, just at the college level. If that reserve was there for, for that purpose, then there should not have been a deficit. The, uh, moving, and what I'm concerned with is a carryover of a deficit. I think that the college needs, needs to fix that problem first before it starts reserving dollars when it's not required. The district has greater than 8% reserve. Just so I can clarify, perhaps I misunderstood. We, we fixed the, seven, the deficit itself. We, you fixed the 17, 18 structural deficit. Correct. But you carried over a $2.5 million deficit from 16, 17. And that has not been addressed, and your 
fix is essentially to take it over a number of years, most of building the 5% reserve level. My, my comment basically is why do you need to build a 5% reserve level when you need to fix your deficit first? Let me so yeah. Yeah, I, I would urge the college to really look at this budget because the budget is a reflection of the goals and priorities of the college. And I've heard discussion tonight of math and faculty. That should have been taken care of in your prioritization of faculty hiring, and, and that should have been covered in the budget. It is. It is covered in the budget, and it was part of our careful, carefully enacted prioritization process. Um, I don't know if my paper um, of last academic year that I shared with the Chancellor and SLT was shared with board members, but it, it, um, it reflects some of my concerns and our concerns that I think widely shared um, at the campus. Um, with some elements of budgeting and um, resource allocation at the district level. Um, both having to do with the BAM, but also having to do with uh, decision making that um, seems to, um, you know, sort of uh, not be completely resolved by the BAM. So um, I think you know, this is um, perhaps a longer discussion than, than the board would, would want on a late night, but I'm very happy to enter into that. Yeah, I, I would just like the college to fix this deficit and to not come back in the next year carrying over to two and a half million dollars. It has to be fixed. Uh, we're saving dollars for a rainy day. Trevor keeps talking about recession, we don't but the fact of the matter is, we're covered in our district and our reserves, and we're doubling in at the college level with another reserve element, uh, which I don't understand. Let, let me let me let me clarify. I, I think I get it now. Um, and, and it's the Chabot plan is to rebuild ending balance to five percent. Chabot did not have a five percent reserve to begin with. So that, that's, it, it's, it's really to build the ending balance to 5%. And the way to do that, plus to cover the 2.5 million negative balance, are those two bullet points. Does that clarify it a little bit? But I wouldn't want to fix it in five years. I'd like to fix it in yeah, at least two years. You know, the state gives us a minimum of three years to get back to our stabilization. We're allowing our colleges to get back in five years. That is not right. Uh, you know, if I had to carry over a deficit in my own budget, <coughs> budget, I'd have a problem moving forward. But, but just, just to be sure, what I'm looking for is the next time the budget comes in, the next year, I expect the deficit to be a priority. Point well taken. I saw a hand yes. on this side. Uh, sorry, you had a question earlier. Well, I just wanted to um, you know, make a point of clarification to uh, Trustee Maduli's um, remark. Um, as of right now, the actual balance for the general unrestricted fund is at 8% set by the board, and that's available on the Chancellor's website, on the Chancellor of uh, Community College of California. Um, but we have a 22% uh, general unrestricted fund balance. So, you know, it begs the question, why is it so much higher than our actual goal? That's a good point, and um, I will answer that question as, as we go along. Um, as, and as, as you know, I'll, I'll get to those next couple of pages. Um, we have an allocation model. Our allocation model is driven by the number of students we serve. We take the number of students we serve and we'll, we multiply it by the revenue we receive by the district. And we call that revenue subject to our model. That model uh, produces a revenue calculation of about $108 million. Our model also says before we, we uh, allocate those funds to the four locations, and the four locations are the 
Chabot College, Las Positas College, District Office, and Maintenance. Before we do that, we're going to allocate a part of it for district-wide expenses, expenses that that, that is not um, um, attached to any given location. So, for example, insurance. You know, we all, we all are covered by insurance. Utilities, the, the cost for audit, uh, retiree health benefits. That's not something that we can allocate to one location. So we take care of, of those expenses first. And then the balance we allocate to the four locations. Okay, and as you can see here, district office, 10.48% and it goes by percentages and, and this is uh, driven by our um, allocation allocation model. Um, I show this every single time I, I, I go over the budget so that we get familiar with our allocation model. This shows all the money that flows through the model. Uh, I want to make sure that there's transparency in terms of how we receive the money, how much we receive, and where it goes. Then going through the, 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 these are the different funds now. I'm not gonna go through each, each fund. You have the, the PowerPoint as well as the budget booklet uh, that's in, in more detail, but we just like wanna highlight uh, some items here. Our unrestricted general fund is now at $129 million. Our restricted general fund uh, is over $100 million. Um, th th there is there is a, a lot of money that uh, is earmarked towards certain um, uh, programs, if, if you will, BOPS, uh, DSPS. Um, some of the uh, the federal funds that we get are all restricted restricted programs. I point this out because th this this puts a lot of pressure on um, really the, the services we provide to to the colleges. Uh, we have more money coming in on the unrestricted side, um, oh, again, over uh, uh, $100 million. You will see the other funds, the, t the, the typical ones, cafeteria, child development, uh, self-insurance fund. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me pause here. Um, th this is our self-insurance fund, retiree medical funds. There's an ending balance of about $4.3 million. That's the amount of money that we're going to be looking at to uh, open our uh, uh, irrevoc irrevocable trust for our uh, OPEB, uh, other post-employment benefits. So that's where the money is going to come from. And we're going to be addressing that in the next uh, few months. Capital projects, uh, the Nike fund, somebody mentioned that the, the, the earlier. There's an ending balance of about $1.3 million in that fund. And here are the... Uh, uh, Fund balances, okay. Um, as you can see here, uh, adoption budget 2017-18, uh, revenues over expenditures. Um, let me point out, like right in the middle of the page, increase, decrease in fund balance for the budget year is $702,000. That means our revenue exceeds our expenditures. That's a good thing. We don't want to spend more than what we're, we're taking in. We started the year with a $28 million beginning balance, giving us an ending balance of about $29 million. That's ending balance of about 23. That's not the same thing as reserve, to answer, to answer your, your, your question. Um, I, I don't have that breakdown, but that's not the reserve that's all available for that rainy day fund. The 8% is, and then there is, there's an amount over and above that. I would be more than happy to bring that at the next board meeting, uh, which will break down that ending balance of about $28.9 million. That's not all um, available. Um, you know, there are certain uh, balances that you carry over that is part of that amount. Again, we can bring that at a later point in time. Um, this is just to graphically show those uh, numbers. And by the way, um, that you know the the, the way we've uh, built, rebuilt our ending balance since the recession has helped the district um, increase its credit rating. So these are some of the things that uh, credit rating agencies look at uh, when they give us our credit rating. Looking ahead, uh, enrollment is going to be the biggest uh, challenge for us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, districts 
all around us, up and down the state, are declining. We are um, steady, uh, if not flat, we're growing uh, slightly. Um, it's just a matter of time when the next recession comes. Um, is it next year? Is it two years from now? It's better to be prepared than um, be surprised by the next recession. Stirs and purse uh, continue to increase, and, and so we've set aside money for that. Um, guided pathways, uh, as you know, that that's how the funding is being driven at this point in time. I put growth versus guided pathways. It's no longer the number of students we serve, but what type of services we provide those uh, students. And then managing our expenditures is gonna be, uh, it's gonna be big uh, as well. Um, planning for the next recession, the CERB that the board approved to offer back in June is, um, is, is one of those things that, uh, this is one of those things that we're doing to plan for the next recession and a CERB is, is, is really managing our expenses, uh, which is salaries and benefits, which is the biggest part of our, of our budget. With that, I'll take questions and comments. Trustee Mitzman. Again, fantastic presentation. You make, make it seem so simple. However, I have a question about this building. I remember voting to purchase this building. The whole upstairs, we're not paying any rent. Because we own the building. But we have revenue from the, the first and second floors. And I appreciate getting this budget in, in advance, but I could not find the revenue for this building in this budget. Yes, I, I, again, you know, th this is like a 30,000 foot level. Um, so the... The, well, the... The funds coming in for the first and second floor were unrestricted funds That's correct. for programs That's correct. at our two colleges. So I would assume it would be in the budget. So that was the first thing I started looking for. And I just don't see it, and I don't think it's transparent, and that doesn't sound like you. I, I don't, I don't understand why I can't find it. Yeah, again, this is the thirty thousand foot level. Um, I, I can go through the, the the budget book and show you where those line items are. Uh, for, for each line item here, there there could be hundreds of entries, um, and I don't think we want to get into that. No, that no. detail, but I can point out to you where those revenues are and in which fund. Okay, I, I would like to see that at another time. Yeah, and get we can end. provide that to you, um, Trustee Mitzman. I will say that we have provided information to the board um, on revenue uh, when it was asked for, and I sent that out, but that's been a while ago, so we can update you on that. That'd be great. Um, and are we, we're, and I'd also like to know where those funds are going from this building, how it's being allocated to the two colleges, what kind of programs, uh, which should be extra programs other than what's in the model, I would hope, so that we're giving more to the to our students. Sure. I will say that, and just uh, to comment on that, um, the colleges generate revenue from the rental of their buildings, classrooms, and facilities, and that's the same as the college, and it resides at that site. It does not come to the district, and just like the district's revenues from theirs does not go to colleges. So that is a policy that this uh, most districts have, as a matter of fact, unless they have a different budget allocation model. But that has been the policy, is that whatever revenue is generated at the college from the rental stays at the college at each colleges. So you're saying what stays, what is what is generated here at the district stays at the district? And goes and into that reserve. Colleges? Yeah, and goes into that reserve to pay for services that we provide, like CLIP, which has been supported by the district, um, providing services like that. So that has been that policy for as long as I've been here, is that I don't, that revenue that's generated stays at the colleges. Lori, do you have a question? Or yeah. let, let yeah. me give let me give you a, a specific um, example on how some of the revenues are, are being uh, spent. Um, if, if you recall, um, the supplemental 
um, employee retirement plan, the CERB, uh, there's a cost to that. And I identified several sources of funds to pay for the cost of the CERB. And one of those sources is the revenue from this building. As you can see, it's the, the revenue uh, from this building will help the entire college. So um, in, in, in some instances, it, it goes for the benefit of the, uh, the entire uh, college. That's just one example. Um, well, I, I don't want to deliver it. It's getting late, and I just, uh, just hey, so maybe um, I get a I'll, I'll, I'll recognize uh, Lori, if you had your hand raised earlier, then I'll go back to you, Trustee, and do it. Um, I just uh, would imagine that uh, the amount of money that we do renting small at our colleges, how much difference are we talking about in terms of the money that we get from the um, renting of the area at this district? I think there's got to be a big difference. Yeah, well, I don't know how much the colleges uh, generate. I don't have that off the top of my head. It's a sizable amount uh, from, you know, the, the rental of facilities and, and it, I'm, I'm not sure. And you're asking me probably something that uh, just right. um, Do we get a lot of money from renting? About 450000 here at Chabot. Can you talk a little bit about what it's used for? Um, yeah. It's used to support programs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. let's not have a sub-meeting. We, we, I know you're asking, people ask a question of the budget this time, and I know uh, Vice Chancellor Legaspi, you're at the podium responding to the budget we're about to adopt some. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just make a, make a point, so just to make sure that, you know, I, I want to make sure that people know that uh, voices are, are heard. We have a planning and budget committee made up of all the constituencies in the district. It's a, it's a district-wide budget committee, and we discuss issues like this. You know, uh, how, how do we spend this kind of revenue that we included in the model? And we have groups of people that look into this and uh, make recommendations on how we can adjust better the model. So there is plenty of discussion in, in this issue. In fact, we're gonna have a meeting a week from this Friday. So there's, there's plenty of representation and dialogue in terms of issues like this. I, I, I wanna make sure that they get lost. Trustee Maduli. I, I appreciate the, uh, the presentation, Vice Chancellor. Uh, I do have one, one concern. Uh, as I went through the budget book, uh, there is one fund that I find uh, concerning, mm -hmm. and, and that is Chicago College's Child Development Fund. Uh, we're, we're breaking even in 1718 by utilizing 335000 of ending balance, increases ending balances. And so we're left with about 12000 what concerns me is looking forward. Is the college looking forward in, in terms of its budgeting when you're looking at all these programs? Child development is one of those areas. That there's always encroachment from the general fund. And, and that concerns me when you start taking a lot of money from there. And what concerns me is you're taking 335000 in 1718. What do you do? That's something that, that concerns me, and I think the college needs to learn. You have a question, uh, sorry? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, yeah, I just uh, two points of clarification. Um, the vice chancellor uh, will be able to answer. Um, so I just wanted, for uh, clarification's sake, so the money that is generated from the uh, revenue from the um, district office is allocated towards the district office, correct? <laughs> So it is at the district office. Not exclusively. Uh, there are expenses that uh, benefits the, the entire district, right. like the uh, supplemental early retirement plan. Yes. But, but it is given towards the district office, correct? It's it's maintained at the district office. Yes. yes. And, um, and uh, again, you, you gotta you gotta um, keep in mind that um, the building needs maintenance. We, we have right. We release, and, and so we need to maintain the building so that. Um, can have a class A building that people would want to rent. So that's, that's also part of the expenses. Okay. And the second question was the, um, so I, I didn't get a clear response on the actual uh, ending unrestricted general fund balance mm -hmm. um, as on the website, on the Chancellor's uh, website, uh, the State Chancellor's website. So if our goal is set at 8% for the 2017 2018 and our long term six year goal is set at 8%, why do we see an increase from 
2013 to 22% in 2015, 2016? 8% is our minimum uh, reserve. Um, the goal for a minimum reserve. We have a higher amount to make sure that we're ready for um, the next recession, and we're calling that our rainy day fund. You know, you, we're, we're looking at um, 28 million dollars. Just to give you an, an idea, uh, one month's payroll for our district is five million dollars, six million dollars, and, and so we're prepared for. You know, if the state doesn't provide us the money, we have the cash to pay our employees. Um, again, uh, the I, I will I will provide that information at the next meeting. We've had this discussion before, and we've provided the breakdown of the ending balance. I think it's it's good to uh, uh, refresh our memories where, where the ending balance uh, sits. Okay, let's. Okay, uh, you have a question again for clarification or? Yeah, just a clarification. Okay. just on that point. Um, thank you, Vice Chancellor Lagoski, for this presentation. Um, so if I remember correctly from the 16-17 fiscal year, we had a reserve, like you put up there, about 20, or a fund balance, ending balance of about 24%. And I know we looked at this last year in PBC, and I am a member of PBC, this district-wide committee that you've mentioned a couple of times. And if I recall accurately, um, the reserve was about 16.47%, I believe, of that 24%. Is that right? So. I'm guessing, and I haven't seen the numbers, that if we're at 23% right now in the ending balance for this adoption budget, I would guess that the reserve is probably around 16, 17%. Is that about right, do you think? That's probably about right, but I, I think we should revisit to make sure that it's right. All right, let's, uh, uh, Trustee Vaccarelli. Just one quick thing. Tonight I heard an awful lot about the engineering program. One instructor teaching five classes. That's incredible. You know, you need some variety. You need, you need. So we have all this nice reserve, and maybe we can afford a little bit to hire an, en an engineer. I also heard that we need some math courses. And remember, math is a gateway to your education. Yes. English. Why don't we have math courses? Why, why are there? Why is there demand for math courses that we're not putting in? So anyway, I just I would like to see a report at the next board meeting what we're going to do with the engineering program. Is that okay. Okay, that that's something that we can do. Let's begin on the budget. Any other question on the budget before are you, are you, uh, Chancellor Legaspe, are you done with your presentation? Yes, and okay. the, the next item on the agenda is to. Um, Approve the budget. Okay. All right. Trustee Madhu, we have one more question. No, I move to adopt the budget. You move to adopt to hear a second. Okay. Move to second it. Any other further discussions? Those in favor of adopting the budget, 2017-18 uh, budget, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. It's been adopted. Thank, Thank you. you.